Welcome, everyone, to the Dennis Prager Show on the Salem Radio Network. So good to be with you once again. My name is Bob France. I am live in Cleveland, Ohio, the ReliefFactor.com studios. AM 1420, The Answer. You can follow me on social media on Twitter at France Rants, F-R-A-N-T-Z, R-A-N-T-Z. You can follow me on Truth Social at Always Right W-H-K. My program is called Always Right Radio. Uh, and it, uh, it's uh, every day from 9 to noon um, at whkradio.com. If you want to listen around the country to what we do in Cleveland, Ohio, it's very similar to what you're about to hear us do once again on the Dennis Prager Show. So I'm going to start out by saying the reality of it. You do realize one of these falls, he's going to clunk his little skull, right? You know that. Do you realize when the stumbling bumbling Skeletor that is the President of the United States falls one of these times he's going to crack open his little Skeletor skull and he's going to slip into a forever coma and we're going to be stuck with President Giggle Salad and that's what I call her sometimes or at least that's what I'm calling her right now we're going to be stuck With President Giggle Salad, and I'll combine those things between President Giggles and President Word Salad. That's what Kamala Harris is. Yeah, that's her. I I don't want to hear, you know what's funny is, not one camera, now maybe I missed it, not one camera um, has captured the the, the mysterious sandbag that he supposedly tripped over at the Air Force um, commencement uh, ceremony. I don't care if it was a sandbag, if it was uh, if he tripped over a peanut, or his own shoelaces. The point is, the man stumbled and he could not stop himself from going down. Just like he couldn't stop himself from going down on the bike, just like he couldn't stop himself from going down on the stairs of the of the of Air Force One. How many times do we have to see? This very, very, very much older than his 80 years man showed that he's not healthy, that he's not capable, honestly, of serving another term. He's just not. And I don't say that to frighten anybody. I don't say that to make fun of anybody. I mean, I'm kind of making fun of him because I'm calling him a, you know, a skeleton or a skeletor, but that's just what it reminds me of. But, but the reality is, It's not his 80 years that make him such a liability. Uh, It's not his 80 years that gave him dementia or pre-onset dementia or, or whatever it is that he's got going on to the point where he cannot speak clearly, that he cannot not mumble and bumble and stumble and fumble trying to figure out what he's... You know the thing. Yeah, trying to figure out what he wants to say. It's, It's not that. I mean, seriously. Repeat the line. Yeah, repeat the line. Read the freaking teleprompter and read the stuff that's supposed to not be said out loud, right? Uh, It's not all of that. It's not his age that makes all of that reality. It's his physical and mental condition that makes that a reality. I've got a caller who calls my program in Cleveland, Ohio, on a regular basis. His name is BJ. He's 92 years old. I would not know that when he calls me. He sounds so much more robust, so much more energetic, so much more with it. He speaks clearly. He speaks concisely. He speaks directly. He is very easy to understand, and you can tell that he's in really, really good shape. And I won't even say for 92. He's in good shape. I can only imagine the physical part. Obviously, it's a radio show, so I I don't see him, but... When I hear him, I am picturing a physically healthy man, and I can definitely tell you by talking to him, he is a mentally healthy man. It's not Joe Biden being 80 years old or 81 years old or 82 years old, or if he finishes you know, a second term, he'd be 86 when it's over. It's not the age. Age, I want to be cheesy and use the, you know, the, the, the cliche about age is just a number, but... For some people, 80 is young and vibrant, given their, you know, given their eight decades on the planet. For some, 80 is really, 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 really a lot. For some, it's 70. 
and they have slowed down. Their cognitive ability slows. Their physical uh, abilities start to weaken. Their physical agility, their ability, their ability to stand uh, and walk strong, rather than shuffling like the old man in a in a home that's wearing his little styrofoam slippers, you know, or those socks with the little grippies on the bottom of them that just kind of shuffles down the hallway of the home from his room to his, uh, you know, to the uh, dining hall, or or what have you. I am absolutely not trying to be ageist when I talk about Joe Biden's, um, what's the word I'm looking for, his, his frailness, his fragility. I'm not being ageist. It's not the age. Like I said, 92-year-old uh, BJ that calls my program is far more with it than Joe Biden is. This is Joe Biden's weakness. And I fear, I kid you not, as much as I fear a cultural Marxist like Joe Biden, or at least Joe Biden doing the bidding of whatever puppet masters behind the scenes are, are you, know, uh, you know, pulling his strings. The idea of a President Kamala Harris is so far much worse. I, I, I cannot put that into words. And the reason why isn't because, well, I think she's corny. I think she sounds dumb. And again, there's nothing to this other than this is how she portrays herself, not as an educated woman, not as an intelligent woman, not as a common sensible woman. She sounds dumb when she talks about anything and she has to construct word salads to try to fill space. She always always, always sounds like the kid doing a book report in front of the class on a book she hasn't read. I'm just going to try to say words, sometimes multisyllabic words, to try to fill the space and make it sound like I know what I'm talking about, and then I'll nod my head constantly to make sure that everybody is in agreement with me. You understand what I'm saying, right? You ever notice that when she talks? Anytime she's in front of a crowd. The, the head is constantly nodding, and then uh, awkward moments when she doesn't know what to say are just <laughs> filled by the giggles, right? It's not just that I look at that and embarrassed by it and am worried about decisions that are going to be made by a person that I just think is a mentally inferior person, not inferior to me. Although, yes, inferior to me. I, I, I believe that. She is far inferior on an intellectual scale to myself, to Dennis Prager, to Sebastian Gorka, to Hugh Hewitt, and I could go on the list of just Salem. But, I mean, literally, I think she's inferior in intellect, in the ability to process, the ability to communicate, the ability to develop and carry out strategic ideas to uh, you know, an average, and I don't even know 4.4, I mean an average high school senior. An average high school graduate. Depends on the school, maybe. My point is, if Joe Biden cannot keep himself upright, he needs to be wearing one of those helmets all the time. Maybe he could just wear his bike helmet, the one that he had on, thankfully, when he fell off the bike. Maybe he can wear one of those, you know, spongy, soft kind of helmets, you know, that they put over football helmets during practice to stop guys from clanging heads together and getting concussions. I mean, there's all kinds of head protection. Because one of these days, he's going to slip or trip on the wrong stairway. It's going to be a steel staircase, or it's going to be, he's going to go all the way down to the head bouncing off of the concrete, and it's going to slip him into a place where he's not functional, to the extent that he's functional already. He's going to have to hand over the presidency, either within the next two years or, God forbid, the American people allow him to have another term. At some point, this frail, old, dementia-addled man will be handing off the presidency to President Kamala Giggle Salad. And that should terrify you. And if it doesn't, then I beg of you, 
do not vote ever again because you're not qualified. I'm Bob Franson for Dennis Prager. we got a lot of work to do today. Stay here. 20 minutes past the hour. Good Friday to you. Thanks for being with us. It is the second morning here in the East Coast. Anyway. No, it's afternoon now anyway. What am I saying? It's the second day in the month of groom in the year of our Lord, 2023. If you missed the memo, um, we have officially changed the name of the month. The sixth month is no longer pronounced June. It's pronounced groom, uh, just so that you know, and it has nothing to do with weddings. It has everything to do with recruiting and indoctrinating children. So that's why Pride Month, the month of groom, will be known as such from now on. I hope you change that literally on your calendars. January, February, March, April, May, groom, July, August, and so forth. I've done this everywhere I go. I've been saying this for a few weeks now because I've been looking forward to the month of groom about as much as I would look forward to prepping for a colonoscopy and a root canal on the same day. Uh, That would be a problem. So the month of groom is upon us. And so last night on groom first, 2023, I went on to um, Twitter to... Well, to to do something that I probably should have done a while ago, and that's watch the movie, What is a Woman? Uh, The movie put out by the Daily Wire, and uh, and particularly by Matt Walsh. I should have done it a long time ago, but I'm cheap. I don't want to pay for it, so I didn't. Last night it was free. I was excited about that. Matt Walsh is putting it up free for 40 or 24 hours, starting at 8 o'clock last night. I said, oh, okay, that's good. I mean, what am I going to do? On a Thursday night at 8 p.m., watch the NBA Finals? Of course not. What kind of a deviant pervert do you think I am? I'm not watching the NBA. So while the NBA played their little game over there with their social justice messages and their little pride messages and so forth, I was watching uh, uh, What is a Woman? Now, I, I had already seen clips of What is a Woman online and on Twitter and so on and so forth, but never watched the entire movie, so I was really excited to do that. And then I I go on Twitter last night, and what do I see? I get greeted by a bombardment of messages from Matt Walsh and from Ben Shapiro and from uh, a host of others who were uh, with the Daily Wire, Candace Owens and others who were just livid because Twitter was censoring or limiting the availability or, or the reach of the link to the movie that you could watch for free. Twitter was calling it hateful conduct, hate speech. Elon Musk had some people working in the organization that essentially said, um, we're going to limit who can view this, we're going to limit who can share this, not going to be able to comment on this. I'm going, wait a minute. I've watched a lot of the clips, like I said, prior to watching the whole thing last night of, uh, of uh, What is a Woman?, what hateful conduct? What hate speech? I don't see anybody being attacked. What are you talking about? And nobody could understand that. Matt Walsh was putting Elon Musk to the test and saying, are you a free speech platform or not? Are we crossing over away from the censorship that used to be the rule for Twitter and for Facebook and so forth? Uh, are, uh, because that's what Elon Musk did with his $44 billion expenditure. He said he was buying free speech to bring it back. Candace Owens last night, what specifically is sensitive about a two-hour documentary that asks, what is a woman? Positively ludicrous to refer to this content as sensitive. People are sensitive. The content is not. She's right. There were just all kinds of people. Now, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to watch it because I could just go to Matt Walsh's page and, you know, his feed and and click the link and watch it. And I let the situation play out as everybody challenged Elon Musk to do the right thing and take the, you know, the, the handcuffs off, if you will, off of the sharing of what is a woman. By the time I got done with the movie, I was more convinced than ever that it was ridiculous for anybody to put any kinds of censor, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, sensitive content tags or warnings or any of these kinds of things, because there was nothing even remotely attacking or hateful about what Matt Walsh did. He traveled the country. He went to universities. He went to corporations. He went to doctors, therapists, psychiatrists, store owners, people on the street. And just discussed this, this transing of America that is going on. The transing of our youth, which is, of course, the real reason for his concern. 
And, and everywhere he went, he was kind. He was reasonable. Was he pointed in his questions because there were certainly, there was an agenda that he was trying to get at? Yeah. But was in any way, did he yell at anyone? Did he curse at anyone? Did he insult anyone? The answer is no. A thousand times over. So by the time it was over, I was really livid that, that Twitter would even, that Elon Musk, that, you know, the, the savior of free speech online in America, the man who really put his own money where his mouth is, and he put his own money where your fingers and thumbs are when you're tapping out messages on Twitter. Let's find out what in the living world this is all about. So um, last night, it was, you know, it was very, very unclear what was going on. I watched it. I was done. I went to bed. This morning, I woke up to see Matt Walsh's feed. Thank you, Elon Musk. Overnight, visibility limits on the movie have been removed. Elon continues to, make, uh, to work to make good on his pledge to keep Twitter an open platform. It was a battle, but free speech wins in the end. The film can now be seen and shared by all. Please retweet. And I was only too happy to, to retweet, that, retweet that and to get that message. I was so very, very happy about that. As, an, as a matter of fact, not only did Matt Walsh point out what Elon Musk did, he and Ben Shapiro and others pointed out that Elon Musk made an even stronger statement. The first tweet this morning from Elon Musk, the very first tweet was, every parent should see this movie. Every parent. And my, you know, this is before I realized that they had, you know, taken off the handcuffs. And so I, I instantly responded, then why did you censor it last night? But, uh, but that's exactly what happened here is I think the pushback, the backlash, and maybe Elon talking to some of the folks that make these decisions for him. You know, he's not absolutely running Twitter 24 seven, but, um, he did what needed to be done there. Did Elon Musk to fix things. And now everybody was able to see it. So what I want to know uh, from you is have you seen it and does it or did it change your perspective in any way shape or form on the month of groom uh, they like to call it pride month I talked about this on Dennis's show last week when I filled in and I'll, I'll repeat it for those who didn't hear it pride in addition to by the way being one of the seven deadly sins the kind of pride that one takes that essentially says I am larger than life. I am larger than God. I'm so proud that I, I don't need anything or anyone else. That's the sinful type of pride. But I'm not even talking about that pride when we talk about Pride Month. What I'm talking about is the satisfaction that one gets from accomplishment. When one does something that was very, very difficult to do and achieves a goal, feels good about what he has done or she has done. That is a prideful thing. What have the individuals who are celebrating Pride Month throughout the month of Groom accomplished? What's their satisfaction level? What did they do? The fact that they exist as, as being attracted to different beings, some that look like them, some that look like animals, or whatever the case might be. What is Pride Month really all about? We're going to explore that, and we're going to explore it in some depth, and I'm going to welcome your calls. 877-243-7776. I want to hear from you. Bob Franson for Dennis Prager. Join us on the Dennis Prager Show. All right, we're teaching today as well. Bob France, substitute teacher, came in out of the bullpen for Dennis as he heads to his listener cruise. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful event, that tour, I should say. And uh, I'm glad to be here in uh, ta and talking to his uh, brilliant audience. That would be you. 877-243-7776. That's 8 Prager 776. It's 34 minutes past the hour. So um, we're talking a little bit about Pride Month. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. It's, it's now called the month of groom. Today's groom second, 2023. And I, I need to hit this um, because I want this to be a part of our conversation. I'm looking very painfully right now uh, on my screen at the cover photo of Glamour Magazine UK version. You probably already saw it. You probably, your eyes still haven't recovered from it. Neither of mine. There's a pregnant woman on the cover whose name is apparently Logan Brown. Um, and the pregnant woman looks very, very bizarre because the pregnant woman has a man's haircut. 
The pregnant woman is body painted into a man's suit that looks like it's ripped open from the, you know, the shirt is ripped open from the bottom to expose the pregnant belly. And this woman um, is talking about in this interview and in this cover story about being a trans man, uh, or excuse me, a trans pregnant man. And as a matter of fact, let me just play this this quick clip for you here. This is this is how uh, she describes herself. I am a trans pregnant man, and I do exist. So no matter what anyone says, I literally am living proof. And uh, yeah, there's more to that, but that's the key. That's the, the the core line you need to hear. Glamour has decided to feature this pregnant woman as a trans pregnant proud man as, quote, living proof that men can get pregnant. You see, because this this woman, and that's what she is, she's pregnant, just like every other human being who has ever been born is, is, is born of a pregnant woman. Um, this woman is going to great lengths to look like a man. Like I said, with the haircut, uh, got some very manly looking tattoos on her on her arms. Um, Obviously, she had her breasts removed. You can see the scars because they've got uh, full topless photos of this woman. And she wants to continue to call herself a man. Glamour magazine wants you to believe that a man got pregnant. Glamour met with Logan two weeks before he gave this is the tweet from british glamour gave birth to his daughter nova to talk about queer love gender dysphoria and navigating the nhs as a pregnant transgender man and so i i just i feel like this needs to be addressed and i feel like some things that are obvious need to be said sometimes obvious things shouldn't need to be stated but but in the case of the transing of america and the complete ignoring of all biological science ever discovered or ever known about human beings and quite frankly about all mammals about who and how mammals can uh, procreate and who carries babies who provides eggs who provides sperm and so on and so forth sometimes these things do, do need to be said out loud and one of the things that need to be, needs to be said out loud, again, is in response to... I am a trans pregnant man and I do exist, so no matter what anyone says, I literally am living proof. And what needs to be said there is... Living proof of what? Living proof that you're, you're, you're a pregnant woman? You literally are a pregnant woman. How do we know this? Because very simply... I'll ask you a question. Do you have testicles and the capability of producing sperm? I am a trans pregnant man and I do. Okay. So the answer is no. You do not. Do you have a prostate? I am a trans pregnant man and I do exist. So no matter what anyone says, I literally am living proof. No, you do not. I would ask you, do you have a uterus? Do you have eggs? Do you have fallopian tubes? Do you have the ability to carry, to conceive and carry and deliver a baby from your vagina through your birth canal? The answer is, yes, you do. That makes you a woman who got pregnant and thus worthy of no covers of magazines whatsoever. I was really enjoying... (laughs) Uh, a couple of the tweets from uh, from Piers Morgan about this uh, this trans uh, man, otherwise known as a woman, who got pregnant. Living proof of what, said Piers. Same thing I said. Logan's a biological female who got pregnant, as hundreds of millions of biological females do each year. Why are you presenting this man as a or this as a man getting pregnant, which is biologically impossible? It is exactly correct. And that tweet of his got 10 million views, 66,000 likes, 12,000 retweets. The public is sick of this woman-denying crap. Women are women. Men are men. And guess what? Spoiler alert. Men cannot 
ever, ever, ever get pregnant. There are some in the trans community, in this ongoing attempt to trans the world, and it's kind of is worldwide. It's, it, it's certainly much, much more pervasive here in the United States where this sexual revolution and now the transsexual, homosexual, whatever sexual, pick your sexual revolution, you know, continues to explode. Uh, but, but it is almost a worldwide thing. Um, there, there's this, uh, this, this belief, if you will, that among some of them that eventually they'll be able to implant surgically a uterus in a male body cavity, in, 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 a, in a male torso. They're going to implant a uterus, somehow attach it surgically to the fake vaginal cavity that they're all cavity they're also going to create and that men one day will be able to literally give birth it is impossible it is beyond grotesque to even think about but since we're there i'll invite you to go on twitter and look at my i'm on twitter at france rants f-r-a-n-t-z r-a-n-t-z one of my retweets is a picture that has been covered up because of content warning. And rare is the time that I agree with the, the moderators, um, you know, covering up things that they find objectionable, May, mostly because the moderators find things like, you know, criticisms of uh, the COVID jab uh, is unacceptable. And they'll cover theirs up with content warnings or what have you. But in this case, it is deserved. And I would never show this picture to anybody without warning them ahead of time. But there is an image that is being put out there, uh, several of them actually, of the plastic surgery results of trying to take a male organ, the penis, to remove it and create from it a human vagina. And, and, you know, I apologize. I mean, use, I mean we're using this, the, the actual anatomical terms here. I'm not trying to provoke and I'm not trying to stimulate and I'm not trying to offend. I'm trying to make sure we really understand this. What you will see if you see that transformation in, in, the prog in progress will make you lose whatever lunch or breakfast you've had already. It is truly as grotesque and horrid as probably anything that Mengele did. And that might be extreme because some of the things Mengele did were just beyond comprehension. But I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is this is beyond comprehension as well. And the worst part about this is this is being done to children served up to the butchers, served up to the mutilators, the genital mutilators by their parents. That's what makes this so much more grotesque. But you will see what the human body, what is being done rather to the human body in the name of advancing the political agenda that is the trans movement. I will not show it to you, obviously, on the, the Salem News Channel or Dennis Prager's uh, 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 video channel on DennisPrager.com, but you can look it up for yourself if you wish. Just know that you're going to be probably sorry you clicked it. I was, but I want you to know when they call it gender-affirming care that is being done for kids, they're lying. We are seeing genital mutilation in the most grotesque fashions, and these are things that are 100% irreversible, and what they're allowing young kids who are under the age of 18 to do, which means they're minors, which means they are, do not have formative thoughts yet, their frontal lobes are not fully developed, they cannot possibly comprehend that what they're doing is going to have an impact on them for the rest of their lives, they can't. They're counting on the adults in their lives to protect them from bad decisions. And the left is counting on cutting out adults from the lives of these kids so they cannot be counseled for uh, or uh, within those decisions. All right. I know you've got a lot to say. Tom is calling us from uh, Glendora, California. Tom, it's Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager. Go right ahead. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Bob. You're doing a great job, as always. Thanks. You know, what you get at this LGBTQ, this mutilation, it's all the rotten evil that has taken over due to pride 
where we become our own gods, we do whatever we want, we don't follow the biblical truth, and this nightmare pandemic of evil that seems to get worse every day is stark proof that if we don't get back to God, read the Bible, pray, and repent, our once great God-based nation will be forever destroyed. It frightens me beyond belief as a 78-year-old geezer. I'm lucky I won't have to suffer, but my poor kids and grandkids will. Let us all pray to God that we reject this vile, evil, satanic deceit that in so many myriad ways is destroying us right now as we speak well tom i appreciate your passion and i I agree with your points as well um it is evil god has been removed uh anybody who would intentionally and knowingly cut up and mutilate the body that god gave us that would intentionally destroy healthy organs do you know how many people suffer every day because they have organs that are not healthy that are not functioning Do you know how many women have tragically had to have mastectomies because of breast cancer? Do you know how they feel when they see these videos and these pictures of young girls or women having their breasts cut off voluntarily because they want to play play dress up as a boy? It's vile. It's repugnant. I'm Bob Franson for Dennis Prager. I'll be right back. Five minutes now before the top of the hour. Bob Fran sitting in for Dennis Prager. We're going to go to Jay, who is calling us from North Hills, California. Jay, it's Bob in for Dennis. Fire away, Dick. Jay. Good morning. At the morning. top of your show, you were talking about the specter of having Kamala Harris as president. Let me remind you that Article 2 of the Constitution states that no person except a natural-born citizen shall be eligible to be president. Furthermore, the term natural-born citizen was defined by Emmer de Vattel in his 1758 book, Law of Nations. And it states states that persons uh, are natural-born whose parents were citizens at the time of their birth. Camilla Harris was born in Oakland, California, of parents who were not citizens. Furthermore, the Law of Nations itself, the title of uh, De Patel's book, is stated in Section 8, Article 1 of the Constitution. Please note the differentiation of the 14th Amendment stating birthright citizenship not being the same thing as a natural-born citizen. It's like stating that all humans are mammals, but not all mammals are humans. So if anyone tries to put Harris into the position of president, it should be and must be vigorously opposed. Well, uh, here's here's what I would say in response to that. And I thank you so much for the phone call. If it comes down to her her um, uh, eligibility to being president uh, for being president of the United States, we're in deep trouble. It should have nothing to do with eligibility. It should have everything to do with qualifications. It should have everything to do with um, her ability to communicate, to process information, to uh, express ideas, and so forth. She has proven herself to be incapable of just about anything and everything she has tried since becoming vice president. She's not qualified. Forget about eligibility. She's not qualified. All I want American voters to do is take a serious and unbiased examination of her public remarks, all of them, for two and a half years now as Vice President of the United States. Anything she has said about the border, which she was supposed to be the czar of, anything that she has said about foreign policy, anything that she has said about energy, anything she has said about anything anywhere, but particularly about yellow school buses and Venn diagram. Watch, if you take an, a, a truly unbiased look at everything she has said, you will come up with one certainty. This woman is too stupid to clean the floors of the White House, much less sit behind a desk inside of it. That is what should preclude her from being president. Bob France in for Dennis Prager. We'll be back with Hour 2 after this. Hour number two of the Dennis Prager Show underway now. Dennis is on the listener tour, 
and uh, I'm sure he's going to have a great two weeks. I'm so glad to be able to sit in for him. Bob France is the name, live in Cleveland, Ohio, the ReliefFactor.com studios, AM 1420, The Answer. That's my home station. Nine to noon weekdays, Eastern Time, and you can listen to it if you are so inclined at WHKRadio.com or on any of the, of course, the associated apps and uh, and listening devices in your home. So I certainly welcome you at 877-243-7776. That's 8 Prager 776. A lot of things still to discuss about Pride Month, otherwise known as the month of groom. Uh, today is groom 2nd, 2023. And um, I want to I want to follow up on uh, the, the Los Angeles Dodger story for a moment. I want to bring it a little local to Ohio, where I am, suburban Cleveland. And I want to bring this to the rest of the country um, because it's um, it's it's quite astounding. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that we've been discussing, the um, that's the group that's going to receive an award from the L.A. Dodgers and Major League Baseball for community service. It's a drag troupe of grown men who wear the nuns costumes, as you know, and then graphically sexually mock Jesus Christ, the Mother Mary, and all Christians everywhere in the most grotesque of ways, mocking and defaming things like the passion and the suffering of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, virtually anything and everything you can think of. What that does to deserve a Community Hero Award I do not know. It's one of the reasons why there's been such a huge backlash against the Dodgers. Such a huge backlash against Major League Baseball. Not as big as the backlash against Bud Light and Target. Yet, we'll see how many more baseball players are willing to stand up and be counted. Many of them are starting to speak out against this nonsense. Many of them. Not enough of them, but many of them. Question also is whether or not they'll have the guts to do more than just speak out, but to take the step that needs to be stake, uh, taken, and that is to refuse to take the field. We're not going to go play the games if you are going to allow the mockery of our faith, the defaming of our faith, not only allow it, but to encourage it by presenting them with, a, with an award for community service. Uh, we're not going to allow that to happen. So two follow-ups to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence story. Number one is it's not just baseball and it's not just the Dodgers that are going to be honoring them. Now, California lawmakers have decided to honor the anti-Catholic hate group and be very clear about this. They're not an organization that's trying to advance the causes of the LGBTQ movement. Movement. They are a hate group that hates Catholics. That's why they call themselves the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Their, their motto is go forth and sin some more. They're mocking specifically Christians and Catholics, right? Well, the, uh, there is a caucus of California lawmakers that is going to present them with an award. As you can imagine, it is California's LGBTQ caucus. The caucus, according to what I read yesterday, is poised to honor a member of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, the controversial, controversial group at the center of the backlash engulfing the Dodgers. The sisters who identify as a group of, quote, queer and trans nuns are known for mocking Christian beliefs, holding an annual Foxy Mary and Hunky Jesus contest, pole dancing on crosses and crucifixes, and using the, uh, the saying, go forth and sin some more. Well, a person named Michael Williams is a member of the group known as Sister Roma. Many of their names are much more graphic than that, by the way. But Sister Roma runs a podcast covering pornographic movies and LGBTQ officials, or excuse me, issues. Um, and Michael Williams, a.k.a. Sister Rona, is on the honoree list for the California Senate's upcoming Pride Recognition Night. In a statement, the LGBTQ Caucus of California legislators said, for more than three decades, Sister Roma has been one of the most outspoken and globally recognized members of San Francisco's Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, end quote. Now I'm going to pause there to ask the obvious. So what? What? 
For three decades, this person has been one of the most outspoken members of a, of a Catholic hate group. That's your press release explaining why you're going to give him an, an award? Somebody help me make sense of that. Honoring the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a group whose sole mission is to sexualize nuns and mock Jesus, reveals the true depth of hatred California's elected officials have for the millions of Catholics residing in the state. That, according to Mark Trammell, Executive Director of the Center for American Liberty. He is, of course, correct. The Sisters uh, do blatantly perverted, sexual, and disgusting anti-Catholic demonstrations proving there they are an official hate group hateful of all things christian and catholic presumably because christianity and catholic catholicism does not approve of the type of bizarre lifestyles that these individuals are engaged in so they are giving an award now to one of the founding members one of the longest serving members of the uh, the anti-catholic hate group an award for simply being hateful now, that's story number one. Story number two, or part two, goes to the local side that I was talking about here in suburban Cleveland. There was um, uh, a conservative figure, an online figure and reporter named James Lindsay, who is reporting and started reporting a few days before the month of groom started, who said that in honor of Pride Month, investigators will be going inside churches across the country to try and expose anti-LGBTQ statements, um, criticism, condemnation, whatever. They're going to investigate churches and other houses of worship in order to expose the, um, the priests and the, and the pastors and the reverends and so forth. Well, out here in suburban Cleveland, Ohio, the suburb of Bay Village, there's a parish called St. Raphael. It looks like Raphael, but it's pronounced Raphael. Okay. The longtime priest who's been serving as the pastor of that parish since 2002 did a sermon this past Sunday in, in advance of um, groom, the month of groom, or otherwise known as Pride Month. And he referenced not Pride Month. He referenced not the LGBTQ community. He referenced only the Los Angeles Dodgers and the hate group that is attacking the church. In a very quiet, somber voice, according to eyewitnesses I spoke with who were at the Mass, Father Tim said, quote, look at the loss as part of his homily, look at the Los Angeles Dodgers, look what's happening, defaming the name of Jesus Christ defaming the name of every Christian here on earth. It just burns a hole in my heart, angers me and embitters me, and it should you. He went on to say, I don't want to give these people a name. I don't want to give them that much credit. But it's happening, and it's also being affirmed. I want to cry. But we have the Spirit. We have the Spirit of the living God who is upon us, who is with us, who is among us, and who is within us. End quote. So I would like to know exactly what and what I just said to you, what I just read to you that was stated by the priest. What exactly was hateful? What exactly was attacking? What exactly was offensive? Because I didn't hear an attack. What I heard was a man who say, expressing his sadness and his anger and his bitterness at the attacks that are levied, levied on the church and on his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's all that he said. But that was enough for a trans stu a person to be in that congregation to stand up, walk to the front of the church, into the pulpit, and to take the microphone and publicly dress down the priest who was saying that mass. Publicly declaring this, hosti this hostility to queer people and trans people and people in the LGBTQ community. It went from being a local story to a national story. It was on, it's in Newsweek magazine right now. He didn't attack anyone. He didn't harm anyone. He simply said, I'm hurt by what is being done to our church. And that apparently is now a crime. I would like to know 
how you feel about that. If you're a Catholic, a Christian, even a Jew that is just a believer in God, how you feel about a statement like that and about the attack he is enduring. I'll be back after this. Twenty minutes past the hour. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager once again on the Salem Radio Network. I appreciate you uh, listening in. If you're watching the program on uh, the Salem News Channel or on the DennisPrager.com or on Rumble or anywhere else that you find us, uh, thank you for doing that too. I welcome your calls now at eight seven seven two four three seventy seven seventy six. That's eight Prager seven seven six. So I just kind of told the story. A moment ago of a Catholic priest in suburban Cleveland where I live um, who gave a sermon in which he included really toward the very end of the sermon it wasn't the whole focus of the homily <clears throat> but he gave a sermon in which he talked about the Los Angeles Dodgers and the hate group the anti-Catholic anti-Christ hate group that they are giving an award to and he talked about how much it hurt and how we have to fight back as Christians with love in our hearts that's that's literally all he said but a parishioner, or at least somebody who used to be a part of that parish, decided to, when he was done, march up to the, to the pulpit and grab the microphone while the father sat down and did their moment of reflection and criticized and condemned him. Newsweek is praising the, uh, the, the disruptor who came in and disrupted the Mass. I mean, you have to understand, if you're not Catholic, you don't understand the, 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 the order of the Mass. But this is beyond the pale. And the way it's being painted by local newspapers and by Newsweek, and uh, you know which are left wing, is that the priest is the villain here. The priest is facing backlash after he discusses LGBTQ controversy during Sunday sermon. The worst part about it is he didn't discuss LGBTQ. He discussed the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and the L.A. Dodgers. He didn't even name the group, the Sisters. He just said talking about the full attack on Christianity, on Christ himself, and on all Christians. That's all he did. And she went up there, dressed him down, and then the coverage of this is, you know, the victimized trans girl in the, in the, in the church that day who went up there talking about how important it is for these trans kids to feel identified and so on and so forth. They made her the victim and the priest ought to be the bad guy. Two questions come to mind <laughs> that I would like you to consider. Number one, what would you do if you went to your mass or your uh, uh, your congreg you, you know whatever whatever it is that you celebrate in your congregation if it's another Christian uh, denomination or if you went to uh, your you know to temple and to a service at uh, you know in your in your uh, it would it's a little difficult of course to cross over to Judaism in this because this is specifically an attack on Christ uh, Jesus Christ son of God and so forth. But if it was just God in general related and went into and across the boundaries into um, uh, Judaism as well, and your priest, or in, in the case of a rabbi, if your faith leader simply said, I don't like that, we were attacked like this, and we should pray really, really hard, that's how we'll fight back. How would you feel about that? The people in that church that day, last Sunday, applauded applauded the priest for what he did, which probably triggered the disruptor even more to go up there and to try to make everyone else feel shame for their own bizarre lifestyle choice and their own uh, you know, disassociation with reality and their own identity and the idea that they're looking to make things more inclusive and so on and so forth for, you know, for trans kids and queer kids and, and all the other description, descriptions that they give. Um, but, but question one is, is what would you do? How would you react if you heard that? Number two, um, will you or do you want your faith leaders to address these types of topics in their, conversa in their, uh, in their homilies or sermons or in their, you know, whatever preaching that they do? Because I personally hope that every Catholic priest in America does something this Sunday, June 4th, to show support for Father Tim in Bay Village, Ohio, and moreover, to respond to the attack on the Catholic Church appropriately that is being done by Major League Baseball and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and the L.A. Dodgers. I hope they all step up. I hope bishops stand up and support and, and, and approve of the message sent by this particular priest, Father Tim, because, again, it wasn't an attack. It was simply a defense. 
He was defending himself and his faith in his church against an attack by a hate group, and people are saying that the LGBTQ people are the victims. How? Why are they always the victims, even if they are the aggressors, the bullies? All right, 877-243-7776. Glenn is in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, on the Dennis Prager Show. Glenn, go right ahead. Yeah, well, so I had a question because I know that you back the blue a lot and, and what's going on in America, things like uh, the, the, the FBI uh, raiding Mar-a-Lago, you got DAs um, bringing up uh, crazy indictments of the like. And uh, in all of these instances, uh, you have the law enforcement apparatus, uh, be it uh, local police, uh, the highway patrol being used by Gavin Newsom, um, the, the FBI uh, being used by, um, by Merrick Garland. You have DAs in New York, district attorneys using the, the power of indictments and stuff. And so what, what I, I'll give you, let me give you my take first and then ask you the question. So what, I, what I've noticed in America is the reason why these things are happening. The FBI um, will, will carry out any order. Uh, Highway Patrol being used by Gavin Newsom is that the law enforcement apparatus, we call them LEOs. The LEOs that we have in America pretty much only know one thing. And that's to, that's to take orders. And, and so that, that fear, that, that scares me, because in all of these instances that I just mentioned, you don't really have a whole lot of... Well, you, you haven't, you haven't mentioned... The the, you, you, hold on a second. You, you're, you're talking really, really, really fast. Uh, you haven't mentioned any instances. We're, we're a minute and a half into well, the conversation, the and I have no earthly idea Hollywood what you're Patrol. talking about. The Hollywood Patrol being shut down, uh, shutting down beaches by Gavin Newsom. The FBI raiding Mar-a-Lago. Uh, the local local police in Uvalde standing down when they should have went in. So you have all these instances where the police are merely taking orders, and and they'll, they'll, they'll they're willing to carry out any order, even against the former president, right? So you back the blue. Do you see any sort of consternation with the Leos in America who are willing to inf- uh, carry out any order? Um. I think I'm what you said. There's some quite local enforcement with federal law enforcement, like federal law are given by uh, the, the, the chief director, the you know, FBI director, Christopher Wray. And, of course, that all comes from Merrick Garland. So much of what the FBI is being asked to do now or told to do or, as you say, ordered to do is political in nature. There are rank-and-file FBI agents who have and will refuse to carry out certain orders. It cost them their careers. We saw some of them, we saw some of them as whistleblowers about two weeks ago testifying before the House Oversight Committee because they were not going to allow the things that they saw happening, illegal things that are being done to the American people, to individual targets of the FBI for political purposes and so forth. They wouldn't do it. And so they, they decided to speak up against it. It cost them their jobs. That's a lot different than the local law enforcement agents or uh, uh, law enforcement officers you're talking about. We'll take a time out here, and I'll come back and try to address more of that on the other side. Dennis Prager Show, Bob France sitting in. That is good advice indeed. Welcome as we continue. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager on the Salem Radio Network. The ReliefFactor.com studio today is here in Cleveland, Ohio. That's WHKRadio.com if you would like to listen to what I do on a daily basis. Follow me on Twitter at France Rants, F-R-A-N-T-Z, Rants, R-A-N-T-Z. So briefly, um, the previous caller mentioned that I back the blue, that I support police, and I do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a television host of a program on a streaming channel called True Blue. Uh, feel free to log on to watchtrueblue.com. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very inexpensive subscription service, but it's about true crime. 
It is very much pro-police. Uh, it is not copaganda, we like to say. It is pro-police, though, but we do indeed call out bad act actions and actors if, uh, if need be. But, uh, but yeah, I do. I host that program, and I've, uh, I've done a lot of work with police organizations and true crime stories for a very long time. Um, does that mean I believe police can do no wrong? Absolutely not. So he asked, what about police? Are they willing to just take orders no matter what they are? Some of them are. Some FBI agents do exactly what they're told to do, even if they know it's wrong. Some of them were willing to go in to a school board meeting, for example, and take down a father complaining about his daughter being raped in a girl's bathroom by a biological boy who was told they could go in there because they'd identify as female. And the school board said, that's the way it is. And this dad complained. So, so some FBI agents... Are, are, are willing to do those things, they'll follow the orders, even if they may not think that they're right, because they want to protect their careers. They want to make their bosses happy. They want to advance. They'll do whatever they're told. And you can decide for yourself whether or not that's appropriate. Some of them won't do it. Some of them say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a part of this. I know this is illegal and that is unconstitutional. Not only will I not engage, I'm going to report it. And then they know sometimes it's at their own peril. I mentioned those four FBI agents who were whistleblowers who testified uh, before the House Oversight Committee a couple of weeks ago about Joe Biden's family cashing into the tune of over $10 million, trading on his name and access to the vice president's office and thus the Oval Office when Joe Biden was vice president under Barack Obama. And they, they literally had their careers and their lives ruined. When it comes to local cops... Yeah, some of them are just going to do what they're told. I mean, see, policing is not terribly dissimilar from the military. You know this from the ranks, by the way, if you just simply look at ranks. Um, they're similar. They're also similar in that foot soldiers are not allowed to question the orders of, you know, officers, you know, whether they be captains or colonels or generals or what have you. Foot soldiers do what they're told. It's not your place to try to figure out why or what we're telling you to do. Just go do it. And it has to happen that way. Otherwise, people die. Otherwise, there are all kinds of, of problems. You can't question the, the, you know, the, the chain of command and, and decide for yourself which orders you're going to follow. It sounds a little like a, a few good men. But, but that's reality. Um, and, and the same is true in many ways, not identical, but similar to, not dissimilar from policing. Police officers on patrol have to follow the commands that they're given and enforce, particularly if there's crackdowns on this particular uh, crime that's been maybe more pervasive, more frequent in our community. Uh, they, we need you to do this. We need you to do that. And they may not want to do that. They may think that it's, that it's pushing you know, the, the envelope in, in the wrong direction. But they have to do it to keep their jobs. They have to do it or else they, you know, get hit with insubordination. That doesn't mean that they're evil and it doesn't mean that they're uh, doing something to harm the people that they are sworn to protect and serve. Sometimes they do have to listen to their superiors. Now, if their superiors do say something that is so egregious and outside the bounds, again, of law and of um, the Constitution that they swore to protect and uphold and so forth, then... Yeah, a lot of these officers will indeed go and take whatever steps are necessary to uphold the law and the Constitution and not harm the constituents or the people or the, the civilians that they're sworn to protect and serve. So I, I, I heard a lot of aggression from that caller that sounded anti-law enforcement, but then more specifically about why can't they stand up for themselves and why can't they do more. And, and again, I think it's just a matter of whether or not the, the individual in, in question prioritizes their job or not. Because if you're willing to lose your job and go do something else for a living rather than do something that you find to be um, uh, out of bounds, if you will, depending upon what the order is, depending on what your rank is, um, you know, they do that. Many of them do that. Law enforcement is not a... Uh, it's not an easy thing to follow. It's not an easy thing to understand. It's not a, it's, it's, it, it's not just cut and dried. It's not black and white. A lot of times there is gray area. And I think many of them follow it as the best they can. Right back to your calls after this. Sixteen minutes before the top of the hour. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager. Uh, <laughs> 
I just saw a text, or not a text, a tweet from Fox News. I mean, first, Mike Pence is getting in next week. Find out Chris Christie is getting in next week. Chris Sununu is likely to get in next week. And this one, Liz Cheney will not rule out 2024 presidential bid. How about that? Didn't she lose her reelection to Congress uh, by like 60 points? I'm not, that's not, I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think it was like 60. It was a crazy number. And she's thinking about running for president. She, of course, is going to be trying to run on the Never Trump card, the Never Trump ticket, the Never Trump campaign. And there are people, of course, who would back her for that. Those, anybody who supported her and her ridiculousness um, um, when it came to the January 6th committee and uh, anything else that she did with the impeachments and so forth. But, uh, but all seriousness, are you kidding me? We're up to what now? That's, that's a good dozen or more? Just briefly, before I go to the phones, President Trump is at it again. DeSantis, Scott, Haley, I'm counting on my fingers here, um, Vivek Ramaswamy, that's five, Larry Elder, that's six, Chris Sununu is getting in, I'm told that's seven, Pence would be eight, Christie would be nine, uh, I know I'm missing some. Asa Hutchinson, thank you. Asa, that's 10. Um, is that it? Okay, maybe it isn't as big as I thought. That's 10. I know there were like 16 or 17 the, in 2016, the first time Trump uh, ran and won. But um, I think that's 10 now, unless I missed a couple, and there might be. Uh, that's, that's really very interesting. And, of course, the anti-Trump vote is all going to split itself, and it's almost a lock that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee. And I'm going to say this, like I said many times, I'm going to back the nominee, even if he's not my first choice in the primaries. And believe me, I've got a lot of choices in the primaries. I've got a lot of people. I've got a lot of great concerns about President Trump and his ability to win the general election, not the, uh, not the um, uh, uh, primaries. I think he'll win those, but can he win the general? There's a lot of concern there, and a lot of people are bringing that up right now. Tommy Lahren, one of the latest uh, conservative voices to say, I'm worried. I'm worried. I, Donald Trump is the best president of my lifetime, but I don't know if he can win. I don't know if he can actually defeat the Democrats who hate him and uh, so very much uh, that Ron DeSantis might have a better shot at them. Let me read her direct quote here, if I can. Uh, I was just reading it during the break. Yeah, she said, I'm going to get heat for this, but I'm being honest. Ron DeSantis has a better shot at swaying independent voters, and that's just the fact of the matter. Donald Trump was the best president of my lifetime, but can he win a national election again? Given everything, fair or unfair, I am concerned. And, of course, she has taken heat for it. Uh, a lot of the president's strongest supporters immediately cancel her, unfollow her, don't support it. You know, everybody that says anything that isn't a genuflection and a kissing of the ring, of course, is going to take that heat. But uh, that's the reality of the situation right now. President Trump is a very polarizing figure. Can he bring anybody in the middle in uh, to grow the, the base? Because right now the base uh, you know, is strong. But it's going to need more than the base. Undecided voters are going to decide this thing, and uh, can he bring them in? It's a very legitimate question. If you want to weigh into that, it's a free-for-all on this Friday edition of the Dennis Prager Show. Let's go back to the phones. We're going to hit up um, Nancy calling us from New Jersey. Nancy, Bob France in for Dennis Prager. Fire away. Bob, you're doing a good job this afternoon. Thank you. Um, I wanted to comment as a Catholic on the Mass in Ohio. You spoke about the priest who very modestly addressed an issue. We have our Catholic Church in the United States to blame for parishioners such as that woman going up onto that altar. Aside from the fact that the altar is a sacred space, particularly during Mass, and that Jesus is present on the Catholic altar during Mass, the host is physically there, she would have known as a Catholic, you don't do that unless you're invited up. That's the first thing. The second thing is the Catholic Church brings this on themselves to have people like this at Mass Mass because of the, I'm going to call it mixed messaging, but I'm going to be truthful and say what it is, absolute corruption and watering down of the Catholic faith by the Pope and by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in this country who control our Mass and our priests in the United States. This priest had every right, and if more priests would speak truth, 
We would attend Mass more frequently. We drive for 45 minutes to a church that gives Mass in Latin because that's the purest Mass we can attend that speaks to our heart. These priests have been, I don't know if they've lost their voice or if it's their courage and their faith that they've lost, but they encourage people like this woman to do what she did. And I pray that the parishioners stood up and defended that priest. I myself would have very loudly started reciting the Hail Mary and the Our Father, but there's a time and a place to voice your disapproval to your priest. And I have had many occasions where I've done it. You do not do it during Mass or on the altar. And shame on the church in America, the Catholic Church, for this mess they've created. I uh, I could not agree more with your with your points here, Nancy. And I thank you so much for the phone call. Listen, I have had m- I shouldn't say many. That's overstating it. I have had occasion to speak with priests outside of the church service. They invite you to the rectory, or they invite you to the confessional, or they invite you just to to go to a community room, and you can indeed express your questions, your concerns, anything else that you have. Well, that's what they're there for. They're there to be spiritual and faithful guidance counselors, if you will, guiding you on your spiritual journeys. And sometimes you have questions. Sometimes you really question something they say. Sometimes, sometimes they may say something that you just patently disagree with. And there is a time and a place. You're 100% right. Like I said, ask to go to have a, you know, a meeting with them and they'll do it. What this was, was theater. Because it's being planned, as I said, there has been an expo- exposure of this. The plan is throughout Pride Month to go to churches and investigate priests and other uh, uh, faith leaders for the things that they're saying that are not necessarily in line with uh, supporting and celebrating LGBT. So they're they're literally performing. That's why she went up on the uh, on the altar. That's why she took the pulpit, and that's why she did what she did so publicly. We'll talk more about that as we continue. Bob Franson for Dennis Prager, right back. Okay, five minutes before the top of the hour. Bob France sitting in for Dennis Prager. We'll go right back to the phones on a free for all Friday, 877 243 7776. That's 8 Prager 776, Minnesota. And uh, this is Daniel. Daniel, welcome. You're on the Dennis Prager Show. Go right ahead. Hey, Bob. You know, Religious rights and parents' rights still remain human rights that demand respect. And, of course, they're, you know, protected by the Constitution. They're supposed to be. And uh, the hypocrisy of these people who are haters, I mean, we're not hating on them. You know, we're tolerating their existence, and they, they want to stamp us out. It's an attack on children. I also want to push... Um, uh, Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman? It's available for free on t- on Twitter. Elon Musk tweeted about it, uh, and then he said it's something every parent should watch, and I completely agree. Yeah, so I, I opened the to, show. Yeah. I opened the show today with that. Um, I don't know no, if you I saw what happened, but I'm last. Sorry. That's okay. I just want to, for those who didn't, I'll just refresh people. That, uh, yeah, last night, Matt Walsh put it up there for free as a test kind of to see if Twitter would allow it to go because it had previously, under previous Twitter ownership, been banned for or censored or limited in its reach for uh, for hate speech. And uh, I was unaware. So, yeah. So last night he put it up there free for 24 hours. Uh, so it ends mm-hmm. at 8 o'clock tonight. And for the first several yes. hours of it, um, it was being censored. Uh, you could watch it, but oh, you wow. couldn't share it and you couldn't comment on it. And everybody, including Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, Candace Owens, the other folks at the Daily Wire, were, were you know incredulous. I mean, what on earth is going on? I thought we were doing free speech again here. And it was overnight. Apparently, these were... Uh, moderators and employees who run this stuff for Elon Musk who are making these decisions. The decisions were reversed, and overnight, everything was cleared up, and uh, and now you can share, you can comment, you can do whatever you want with this. And Elon Musk, as you said this morning, actually message to everybody, every parent should see this movie, and I concur. They should. Yeah, yeah, 100%. God bless them. Yeah. I watched it last night for the first time. I had seen plenty of clips of it, like a lot of other people have as well, because they've made them available. Uh, But I watched it last night in full, and I completely concur. If you are not watching and becoming aware of the lunacy that the transing of America is based upon, the refusal to accept 
biological science, the refusal to accept uh, that which we have always known, then you are doing a disservice to your children because they are going to hear about this stuff. And if you don't educate yourself about what they're hearing, how are you going to be able to explain, to counter, to bring truth, to bring reality to the conversation with your kids? You need to know what they're being taught. You need to what they're, know what they're being told and the types of people that are truly a threat to their own physical and mental and emotional development. Those people are highlighted in this movie. I'm Bob France, in for Dennis Prager. One more hour to go on this Friday. Stay with us. The third and final hour of the Dennis Prager Show for this week is now underway. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. If you have been with us through the first two hours, thank you so much for that. I always like to thank my listeners. If you listen for 10 minutes or for all three hours every day, I appreciate you doing it when you can. We're trying to give you something of value. Hopefully you're taking something of value away from it. I'm Bob France, in for Dennis, live here in Cleveland, Ohio. The ReliefFactor.com studio is in uh, AM 1420, The Answer. My uh, daily show is 9 to noon Eastern Time. You can listen to WHK Radio if you are so inclined. You can also follow me so we can engage with one another that way on Twitter at France Rants, F-R-A-N-T-Z-R-A-N-T-Z. I wanted to make note that today is Friday, the second morning of the month of groom in the year of our Lord 2023. I wanted to make note of something else. <clears throat> Not a lot of people have been talking about this. Uh, But you probably should. Today is the day, three years ago today, rather, this is the anniversary, the tragic anniversary anniversary of the death of a police officer in St. Louis named Captain David Dorn. Most people don't know about this. You may have at the time, you probably forgot about it, but the reality is Captain David Dorn was killed by radical, violent, Black Lives Matter and Antifa monsters Uh, on June 2nd of 2020, which was a part of the BLM riots over George Floyd. And I bring this up now for two reasons. Number one, it's the anniversary of David Dorn's death. He was trying to protect and serve, and he was killed by these rioters. His name should be remembered. That's number one. Number two, since we had a previous caller ask about police and about policing, do it, police officers doing exactly what they're ordered to do and whether or not they should buck those orders, whether or not they should uh, ignore the orders from superior officers and run the risk of you know, being reprimanded or losing their jobs or whatever the case might be. Uh, so, so technically three things. Number one is David Dorn. Number two is that. And number three is... You don't know David Dorn's name, but you know George Floyd's name because there is a mural, multiple murals and statues and memorials dedicated to his memory in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I saw this. I didn't bring it up on my program, my local program in Cleveland this week, but I wanted to and I probably should have. And now that we are reminded of David Dorn's death and nobody cares about that, I think it's worth pointing this part out. David Dorn died June 2nd, 2020, murdered by BLM thugs in St. Louis. Nobody knows his name. And George Floyd, they just held over Memorial Day weekend, a massive memorial in his honor. George Floyd, who once robbed a woman at gunpoint, putting the gun, by the way, to her pregnant uh, abdomen, lived an entire life, an entire life filled with criminal activity, including using, selling, and trafficking in drugs, robberies, all kinds of violent crime. He was a career felon who happened to die, as we all know, under the knee of a police officer, as if that and that alone was what took his life. And as if that and that alone is reason enough for him to be celebrated as some sort of a folk hero. But that's what they're doing. George Floyd robbed that woman at gunpoint, committed all of those acts that I talked about, died in my estimation and in the belief of many medical professionals The amount of fentanyl in his system was enough to kill him. The amount of methamphetamine in his system was enough to kill him. The amount of both of those things in his system certainly would be enough to stop his heart and to stop him from breathing. 
the fact that that happened while he was being kneeled on by a completely obtuse and maybe dangerous uh, police officer named Derek Chauvin, those two things may have been coincidental rather than one causing the other. Or they may have been equally justified, or rather, not justified, equally to blame for the death of George Floyd. But regardless of how you see that, I give you this. The Minneapolis community came together Saturday to remember George Floyd's life and legacy. The Rise and Remember Festival attracted hundreds of people to George Floyd Square. I like the way the community is together, said Orlando Matthews, visiting from New Orleans with his son. You see people from all sorts of places. People here to honor the legacy of George Floyd. George Floyd Square has attracted a lot of people from all over the country, the story goes. George Floyd's global memorial has about 200 pieces of what organizers call protest art in his name. I'm curious. Where's David Dorn Square? You may know, where's Captain David Dorn Square? Where is the tribute and the memorial to David Dorn, who was killed as a police officer protecting the citizens of St. Louis by Black Lives Matter rioters? Thugs and rioters from BLM and Antifa killed that man. Does his life matter? For those who do not know or do not recall, David Dorn is black. If black lives matter, where's David Dorn's square? Where's David Dorn's memorial service? The Minneapolis community came together to remember George, Flo George Floyd's life and legacy. I'm here in solidarity, said Monique Cullors Doty. The community has really kept his legacy alive. Well, if the community was going to keep George Floyd, Floyd's legacy alive, why aren't they distributing fentanyl to everybody who came to the, to the party? Why aren't they di distributing methamphetamines, cocaine, weed? Why aren't they giving away uh, 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 um, uh, illicit weapons? Why aren't they out there uh, committing felonies against one another? If you want to keep somebody's legacy alive, it just strikes me as being so extraordinarily um, out of balance that a black man named David Dorn, who was a community hero, is ignored and forgotten despite his being murdered by BLM thugs who were rampaging because of what happened to a career felon named George Floyd. Now, if it's not clear, let me make it clear. I do not support what Derek Chauvin did. Derek Chauvin is an idiot, and Derek Chauvin is ultimately going to have been responsible because of the way things went down and were reported for more damage to race relations in America than anybody since, I don't know, James Earl Ray. I mean, honestly, it's ridiculous. Derek Chauvin is is a disgrace to the uniform he's a disgrace to policing he's a disgrace to all that is good and true and he'll his impact will be felt for so long but let us not forget derek chauvin didn't kneel on the neck of a pastor who spent his life serving people george floyd was an evil violent criminal not a saint, and yet there are stained glass windows that have been built and created with his image, as if he was exactly that. I say today that our prayers and our, our condolences are with the family of Captain David Dorn, police officer David Dorn, who was murdered in the George Floyd riots who did nothing to deserve what happened to him, who broke no laws, who committed no crimes, who was not a felon, who is just as dead as George Floyd is, and no one cares about it. That's a problem for me.